Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this afternoon's Sustainable Futures seminar, um, in the latest in the seminar series. Um, we've got two speakers this afternoon. Um, Professor Jenny O'Brien, who's the Academic Lead for Sustainability Teaching and Learning at Manchester, and also the Inspired and Informs Futures Lead for Sustainable Futures. Um, and generally presenting on 43,000 Strong Force for Change Sustainability Impact Through the University Living Lab and Student Assessment. And following Jen, we've got um, Dr. Paul Bagley, who's a lecturer in project cost management in the Department of Mechanical, Aerospace and Civil Engineering at Manchester. And he will be presenting on using artificial intelligence to estimate the cost of engineering sustainability and social responsibility, the role of cost engineer and project management. Um, the talks are about 20 minutes long, and then there'll be Q&A after each one. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Jen, who will kick us off. Thanks. Thank you, Steve, so much. Let me just do the honours and share the slides. Okay, so is that all okay? Just give me a thumbs up if that's all right. Yep, all good. Lovely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, um, everyone, for being here. And uh, I thank you for the introduction as well, Steve. I have no need to go through who I am and what I do. Um, what I'd like to do today, if I may, is to share with you this this concept, if you like, this, this body of work we've been engaging with through the university and through Sustainable Futures, which is both a tool for, I would argue, really um, powerful, accessible, and um, impactful uh, student learning that's affecting change for sustainability, but it's also become a much bigger vehicle for us to think about our sustainability operations and actions across the university, very much bridging across research, teaching, and our operations. Um, so 43,000 strong force for change. That is our students at the university. And before I begin, it's funny, we were having a little chat before about imposter syndrome. Um, I always forget to mention that this work has been recognised nationally and indeed internationally. Um, those of you who work in education for sustainable development, A, you might recognise how I've horribly plagiarised the tool um, into our uh, inspired and informed challenge within sustainable futures. But indeed, the University Living Lab was recognised as good practice to achieve ESD by um, Advanced HE and QAA. We won the really the that very early on good practice examples for the framework. And we've been recognized with a host of different awards, a host of different resources, and we're really instrumental in the university's success, both in the Times Higher SDG rankings and also the QS sustainability rankings as well. And that then is, is meant to build my confidence to share with you what's been a, a complete labor of love for about, about seven years now in different guises, starting a uh, different form a few years ago and then progressing through the pandemic into being an active piece of work at the moment. And right now, I think we've got about 300 students, undergraduate to postgraduate, who are engaging with uh, the Living Lab as we speak. And if I may, just to, to share, one of the double-edged swords about this piece of work is it can be considered from the perspective of an organisation, and by organisation, I'm framing the most possible broad sense from NGOs, charities, public sector, private sector, big, small, and everything in between. Um, it works really well for educators, and again, most broadly framed, whether you're a lecturer, whether you're working in careers, whether you are a researcher, for example, and it's also really applicable to our students as well. So please forgive me, it's, I'm always trying to think about the three different positionalities that are represented here. I'll do my very best to tease it out in the 20 minutes that we have, but please don't hesitate if you have questions um, at the end as well. Okay, so what is a living lab I hear you cry? So living labs are defined in all sorts of different ways, depending upon who is using them. Um, I'm very honored to be one of the co-leads of the EAUC's community of practice for uh, living labs with Leeds University. So it's only right that I should use our own uh, definition. If any of you are on campus at the moment, you're probably sat in at least the, the best national, if not international example of a living lab, which is our Oxford Road corridor. It varies a little bit depending on how people are using them, but essentially a living lab is a, a, an experimental way in which we can address real world problems through dynamic partnerships. And there it's not at all accidental that both Inspired and Informed and SDG 17 is trying to illustrate this idea of the strength of partnerships that we need in sustainability. 
so that we there be, being a, a greater sum of our parts, if you like, bringing together multi-scale and multi-actor stakeholders to view these problems differently. A living lab is then about collaboration, um, liberating intellectual potential and addressing these practical challenges. Surprisingly, and I'd also argue really importantly, thinking back to our six R's, a lab actually doesn't require or shouldn't require additional resources. It uses what we have. And one of the things that we have a lot is students. And many of you might be familiar with the students as partners literature. This dates back to um, HEA, which is now advanced HE back in 2014, that talks about the power of working in true multi-beneficial partnerships with students to the academy, to inquiry, to the, um, the institute in which you're working. But my argument has always been that what's missing from the students as partners discourse is the power of students to affect change in the real world. So beyond the academy, beyond the university. And if we think back then to the idea that a lab should use what we have, we have 43,000 students. This is a statistic, in all honesty, that keeps me awake at night. So the scale of our opportunity here is incredible. So 43,000 students, if each of them gave me just one of their assessments, we could harness seven and a half million hours of research time every year. So this is time that exists anyway, time that we are spending, losing, depending upon your definition or your, your positionality, to yet another essay. So time that we could harness within our existing resources within the university. And this is what we're aiming to do within the University Living Lab. Now, as I say, our University Living Lab is a tool of this broader concept of working together. And I should also say there's a host of other amazing examples of students working in partnership with universities to affect change. So there's the One in Five Dissertations project, for example, there's some incredible work in Strathclyde with the integrated SDG uh, learning that they do. There's the NUS's Dissertations for Good. Our niche is more the fact that we are using what we have. So it's not an additional project, it's not doing something else, it's engaging this assessment opportunity. So it's almost like a circular economy of knowledge. On the one hand, organizations need research. On the other, students have to do assessment. So why don't we make that assessment useful? Why don't we harness that seven and a half million hours of research time every year and link together the needs of organizations to our students through their assessment. Okay. And as I say, the scale there is a little bit challenging. So 43,000 students at our own institution, that's then seven and a half million hours of research time is otherwise just being lost to another essay. You scale that up to the number of students expected to be in higher education by 2050. And we could be harnessing 40 billion hours of research time every year through existing resource, through assessment. Now let's not run before we walk and think about our immediate sphere of, of change, but we have this incredible opportunity. So if I may, let me explain to you how that works. And as I say, explain the tool, um, but also try and pick out the broader opportunities that we have here as well. So very simply, I will work with an organization, if you are one, very happy to have a chat with you and help you frame the research that you need for your sustainable development work. And we frame each of our projects around the SDGs. That then is added to our database. Now, if you're an educator, this is where we have two different opportunities. We have a database around 150 projects at the moment, 50 partners, global to local, and you can drop this in to a unit. So a number of units, and I'll give you an example momentarily, are using applied research as their core assessment. And I've got a whole host of resources to support you in that space if you are interested. Likewise, if your students engage in this presentation, this can be a bank of inspiration, perhaps for a dissertation, perhaps for a piece of coursework. I've had retirees stumble across our website and say, I'd really like to do something useful. Is it OK if I research one of your projects? So it can be that bank of inspiration. And our commitment is we will close the feedback loop, as I'm going to explain to you momentarily. So any work that is submitted that addresses our, one of our research challenges, we will link back to the organization. So work with the organization, we set the challenge, it goes into our database, students choose the research and they adapt it from their disciplinary perspective. They undertake their, uh, their research within their talk course as normal. So again, no add-on in this, this particular approach. And it's then marked by their course leader as normal. And then what we do is our platform will return that research report back to the organization that set it. And then over time, 
we link back to the student any evidence of impact that has been made through the student's research, however small. Sometimes it's literally uh, we utilized your up-to-date statistics or you had an amazing reference list. Um, it's gone through as far as students critiquing the approach of the organization, saying, but actually, you're not inclusive enough. And they've gone, oh, good point. OK. And change of operations as a result. We have a host of different physical impacts that I could share, but this is always going to be my favorite one. So this is an office block that is currently exists. It's been built uh, in town. Um, and the organization set a challenge saying, oh, we're kind of interested in bubble beehives. Could beehives be part of a, of a, a development? So some students, two students, interdisciplinary students were working in a team for a taught piece of research. It was the, the assessment on a taught course and undertook this research. Now, there is now an office block in town, which because of our students' assessment has two bubble beehives as part of it. So bees, key of biodiversity, the symbol of Manchester is shown there to the mosaic on the uh, town hall floor. And a really lovely example of our students' assessment physically reshaping sustainable urban infrastructure in our fair city. And that's the power and potential that we have there. So as a tool, it's really effective. And if I may, just for the next five minutes or so, let me also share with you the broader benefits of that as well. So of course, and this is a great experience um, for our students. So a number of students have either attributed their current employment to this opportunity, um, or indeed were employed by the organizations that they did their research for. And remember, this is not additional. This is not another project that we have to resource and we have to maintain in a resilient way. This is utilizing the assessment, which is a core element, a mainstay of university learning. So to bring the student voice in there very clearly, a lot of students said this, so they really enjoyed the assessment. It is different, it is challenging. To my mind, there's no point doing something that isn't. Um, students then kind of they enjoy undertaking this real world experience. But as I say, a number of them have attributed their employment to this um, particular experience, whether they've been employed directly or it was, I've had feedback time and time again that writing a professional report for an external organization was what employers picked up on. Um, and thanks to Sarah, who's here today from our UOM careers service as well. One of the things that's come through is that enables students the opportunity to show their real passion as well. They can talk passionately about something they invested in, focused on and affect change through. And I've also found then that students said they've really enjoyed this experience. I've been working very closely with the 300 students that are on the University Living Lab at the moment. We have this back and forth in a post-pandemic higher education landscape to enable students' voices to come to the fore is not only really powerful for them and their student experience and for them to feel valued, but it's affected much greater change. So for example, it was a terrifying moment when I received an email from Alexis saying that he was on his way to Ghana to enact the project that he had investigated for his university living lab. Now, as a, as a pains to say, that's not part of the expectation uh, of our programme, but he was so inspired. He'd done this work. He did his own uh, uh, fun fundraising to be able to go to Ghana and to undertake that, that work. We've worked very closely with student organisations across the university, so the What Not Way Shop, um, who are currently researching a library of things to host through the What Not Waste to the benefit of our student community and then to sustainability. I'm going to link them up with an existing University Living Lab project we have around libraries of things. Um, students have gone on to present Instagram feeds, for example. They've worked on external partnerships as well. So this was a few years ago where one of our students decided to investigate one of our University Living Lab projects in conjunction with a number of community groups across Manchester. And it was um, then went through the ethics councils and it was uh, became quite a formal piece of research. We've also got to the stage now where our University Living Lab can be useful. So truly honored that the new uh, Masters in Sustainable Business that's coming out of AMBS is using our Man University of Manchester University Living Lab as a core part of their assessment approach. And it's been lovely then to be able to be a vehicle for different educators sourcing projects in that space that could be of particular interest to students on the course. It's great for employability, great for student experience, and again, in a real light touch way, but we're also then generating an open source of knowledge. So often students say to me, oh, do I have to apply to a, a project or how many, how many students can undertake it? And what we find is more students doing the same project, we make our projects live wherever possible with permission of the organization. The next student who researches in that space can build upon that knowledge. And so we have this really rich, insightful 
um, challenging view on the research. Students can build on that information. It becomes an open source of knowledge. I'm sure a number of our projects, you could replace the uh, focus on Manchester for Leeds, for example, or they are uh, insights that are applicable to different organizations and it's then really accessible. If, and I appreciate our next conversation is about AI, so please apologize, apologies if I'm treading on toes here, but the other thing that's really interesting is we are focusing on students' skills and their understanding rather than knowledge and information. So because it is um, applied research, we're then largely chat GPT proof, longer discussion for another day, but it's lovely then that we can really channel ESD skills and competencies through the applied research model where students' understanding comes to the fore rather than lots and lots of different information. And we also find there that we get this real interdisciplinary opportunity to add value. So because we frame our projects around sustainable development goals, there is, I've never been in a situation where there isn't something that appeals to students' interest, but our interdisciplinary approach really adds value to an organization. So it's not just free research time. We've got to the stage now our organization's been quite challenged by our students' research and thought, oh gosh, we've never thought about it from that perspective. We've always employed mathematicians and physicists and in actual fact a gendered approach has been really powerful. An interdisciplinary approach, which has critiqued some of our current understandings and, and looked at it differently. So yes, on the one hand it is free research time, but our students then really add value by connecting this huge knowledge base that they have and not all of our organizations, particularly smaller international NGOs, for example, have access to and framing this problem quite differently. And that's also enabled us to strategically co-produce our sustainability agenda. So I've got to the stage now where students are proposing projects, perhaps from a charity or an organization that they're really passionate about or they're working for. We've also got to the stage where students that were in, uh, who attribute their employment to being part of the University Living Lab are now putting projects back into the lab from the position of their current employment. And it's also enabled these broader strategic partnerships. So for example, I'm really grateful to Manchester Council, who was an early uh, partner in the University Living Lab. And they, they kindly said it's helped them see the university as this partner going forward. We've affected lots of change within our own campus, perhaps a more traditional understanding of the Living Lab. And um, most recently through a reusable cup scheme, for example, where we brought together our polymer scientists. We had students looking at different apps that enable us um, to roll out this excuse me, campaign in the most effective and accessible way. We're working with our students' union through societies, but also in terms of their own uh, running, for example. Um, and it's also really interesting, we've got to the stage now in co-production that I have, as one example, air quality projects from Manchester, from Malawi, from Kampala, for example, is giving us a real insight into what sustain sustainability challenges or needs are globally as these projects are coming through. And also, and perhaps most importantly, the Sustainable Development Goal framing enables all students to see themselves within the sustainability agenda. Now, I, like most of us, I'm sure, would levy um, uh, evidence and quite considerable critique on the SDGs. They're far from perfect, but I think they are this very accessible vehicle to enable students to see themselves as part of this, this discussion. So if maybe carbon is not a language that immediately speaks to them, working within gender equality makes them realize these linkages, for example. And just to end in my last couple of minutes, I should appreciate we had some recent funding through HIFE, which enabled us to employ a student experience intern. I'm actually advertising for another one at the moment, if any of you might be interested. And one of the things that the students kindly did was build our Instagram feed. Now I use this mainly as a notice board on our platform, I am too old for Instagram, I cannot deny. Um, but just to note the fact that we have we have this feed growing, and if you're at all interested, that's an immediate way in which you can connect to us. Okay. So just to sum before we open up for questions, the, the University Living Lab, it is a concept. So living labs within sustainability are far from you. Our University Living Lab tool within that has been this really powerful way in which we've been able to work together in partnership to affect change. It is simple. And it's one of the things I find quite intriguing. Often people are put off, they go, what's the catch? How did this work? It's so simple, but it's been really effective, both in terms of student experience and employability, but also to affect change for sustainability and to bring everybody along on this co-constructed agenda together to enable those uh, sustainability transitions. 
it is experimental by default. A university lab, a living lab is supposed to be experimental. It's supposed to be trying different things in an evidence-based uh, and impactful way. And ideas are most welcome. As I say, we've been used in new developing master's units, for example, uh, a whole host of different ideas going forward of how we can grow and expand this work. So be delighted to have any conversations with you. And if you're sat there thinking, oh, I've got lots of projects that I'd like students to engage with the University Living Lab, please feel free. There's a QR code there that links through to a very simple interface that you can put a project in. Or likewise, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll happily uh, take any questions. Okay. And that's me. Um, the final slide is just the uh, references. So thank you. Thanks so much for, for listening. Um, thanks, Jen. That was really interesting. It really sort of sums up the, inter inter the interdisciplinary approach that we can bring back on these sustainability challenges. Um, it's great to see the university having that impact, really, um, and benefiting students at the same time. Um, uh, so in terms of questions, um, we've, got about five, we've got about five minutes of, of time for questions. So if anyone's got any, put them in the, put them in the chat. Um, but to kick us off, um, how can you ensure that University Living Lab projects meet intended learning outcomes of the courses? So it's a really good question, um, and it's one I get a lot in all honesty, and I think it, I think this is also where the simplicity of the model uh, confuses people a wee bit. So the idea is our projects, which are as accessible to any students as we possibly can be, can then be a database of inspiration. So they should then meet your intended learning outcomes because students will tailor our concept notes to your coursework, for example. So I've, I've discovered an awful lot of coursework, which is very broad, as a, the example I used earlier, critically evaluate sustainable development initiative. So rather than doing one which is theoretical, why not do one which is real? Um, we have a number of projects that are essentially asking just that. And our commitment would then be that we would close that um, feedback loop uh, and get your students' research back to the organisation and return any impact to them. So in that case, we are offering them the inspiration for the students' coursework rather than us delivering the assessment ourselves, if that subtle distinction makes sense. So it would then meet the intended learning outcomes of your uh, taught unit because the focus of the assessment would deliver to your ILOs because the assessment is delivering to the ILOs, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um... So we've got a question from Dorian, um, who says, um, she's from the living, sorry, from the library student team. How do you think the library could help and create partnerships with the OM Living Lab? And could we post projects to help make the library more sustainable? Yeah, 100%, um, most happy to. And we do have a number of projects from internal groups as well, but within the University of Manchester. So social responsibility and widening participation. And, and absolutely, it'd be wonderful to work together around the library and get students more involved. I think that's particularly powerful for students as well. So generally we can close that feedback loop more quickly because it's internal and it's on campus. Um, if you think back to the students as partners literature, it's a really powerful way that students can then immediately see the change in their own campus space. And likewise, it's been a really um, powerful way to understand what our priorities of students as well. So yeah, 100%, Joe, I'm very happy to, to connect and absolutely get some students working on projects within the library um, and then double-edged sword, uh, extra wins, they can do that for their assessment as well. So yeah, happy to, thank you. Thanks. Um, just to, just to, when, you were, when you were talking there, I just, just suddenly thought about ID Manchester as well, if that could be something that could be involved in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the opportunities are endless. And, and likewise, if if there are any researchers who, and forgive me, 20 minutes is very difficult to go into the depth of opportunity here, but if there's any researchers who, for example, are thinking about taking their research in a new direction and need a, a broad insight, or you know, I get lots of projects which are case study analysis or horizon scanning or uh, summaries of sectors actions at the moment, for example. So yeah, very, very much so. Internal projects, absolutely, ID Manchester would be a great one, the platforms. And um, that's why I use the Students' Union example as well. So we do have a number of projects from actual unions within the Student Union, groups, uh, societies within the SU, but also the SU have put a project in and they're really interested in how they've asked for a project, which is essentially horizon scanning the employability skills that their SU personnel should be learning. 
and they feel they they wanted more of insight into that. So yeah, absolutely, I'd imagine it would be great. And that's also where the interdisciplinarity comes into play as well. So immediately think, well, if engineers could work on an ID managed project, that'd be fantastic. But this is where we also add value, where an organization has their, their issue, their project addressed from a perspective that they were completely either not imagining or not expecting. And I've had organizations say, gosh, we'd never thought that I don't know, climate catastrophe is gendered or I did have a student once who critiqued the, as I say, critiqued the work of an organization saying they weren't inclusive enough and we can feed that back to the, the group as well. So, so yeah, I'd imagine it would be fab. I'll, I'll uh, hold you to that one, Steve. I'll follow up with you. It'll be brilliant. Um, yeah, and um, probably got room time for one more. Um, what are the challenges to scaling up the benefit of, re what are the challenges to scaling up the benefit of research and teaching? So it's, it's a really good question, that one. Um, one of our real strengths is we have been able to scale. And, I, and, and just to, to repeat, with huge respect to some amazing projects that are available nationally and indeed internationally, projects like the NUS's Dissertations for Good, our particular niche is that we're using what we have and that has enabled us to work at scale. So we've got 300 students working through the University Living Lab at the moment, harnessing that assessment opportunity. And we've been resilient. If anything, we grew during the pandemic exactly because we are desk-based. Many of our projects require students to use uh, resources that they can access through the library, for example. The really interesting bit that I'm trying to think through in more detail now is that works beautifully and we can scale to that effect. Some of the value added that's coming through our organization, uh, sorry, through our, our partnerships, requires a bit more hands-on engagement and thought. And this is my, my challenge at the moment in terms of scaling. So for example, I've learned so much working in partnership with our students who are undertaking these uh, research projects at the moment. Um, I always recommend doing a proposal, for example, and talking that through with students. I get this incredible insight into what's important to them around sustainability and what are their priorities, or I've learned more about interdisciplinary sustainability from that perspective. And I think this is one of the things that I'm trying to conceptually work through at the moment is where should our focus of impact lie? So we could have a huge impact in terms of our students undertaking client-based research that we're sending out to the organizations and they're utilizing that student's research. And that's then the tool, that's sort of the, uh, deploying a living lab concept through students assessment but there's this much bigger opportunity there um, in terms of scaling up where I could add a lot more value and learn a lot more by working in genuine partnership with our students to benefit sustainability transitions and that's the bit where if we grow any more I'm going to have to tap some university source up for a bit more money because I can't do it all myself. Great. Thanks a lot Jen. Um, uh, thanks for the, the Q&A and the talk. So over now to Paul, um, if you'd like to please come around and share your slides. Hi everyone, thank you David. Uh, let's see. Oh. Um. Ah. Is that okay? Um, I think we can see the um view. Brain, thanks. Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so today is just about what is cost engineering? What is what is the cost of sustainability? And how does artificial intelligence, what's the opportunity of doing that? So there's, there's our fundamental questions. And I guess the fundamental answer is, which is what this is about, is that the cost of sustainability is being worked out by cost engineers to a larger or lesser degree. There's a whole lot of variation in that um and uncertainty and definition what is the cost of sustainability and ai is potentially useful because there's lots of data which can be input into ai um lots of uncertainty and so 
these AI methods can process the complexity of the model. But however, uh, just like any modeling problem, if there's high variation and high complexity, that's difficult to get an accurate response from anyway. So that's kind of it. But uh, here's the detail of what I'm going to do, what I'm going to talk about. Um, not many people know what a cost engineer is. Many people misunderstand that. So that's that's our principal focus, is the role of the cost engineer in industry. And they develop cost estimates. They have to record those cost estimates as best practice. So when the cost is wrong, they've got a record of why they estimated that cost and why it was wrong. So when Typhoon was over budget, if it was, then the cost estimates can be referred to. We're going to look at what is in the estimate and what is out of the estimate. And uh, such thing as the estimating process, uncertainty. And then I've got a case study at the end to look at that. So what is, what is a cost engineer? Um, many people misunderstand this. If you walk into a company, any, any large organization, any organization, people think the cost engineer is an accountant and um, they believe costs are all accountancy related quantities which have been defined by accountants and you see in financial accounts, financial account statements and that's how the world works. Well, it isn't. A cost engineer is an engineer and they have to work out the cost implications of all sorts of costs. But I believe the word cost is overused. It should be effort because effort is about how much material and labor is expended through activities. So what's the effort involved in a project um, and how do you predict that at all stages of a project's full life cycle from early stages to this is a long range aircraft to, okay, here's a specific factory. This is how it's going to be made and here's how it's going to be used. And here's all the support envelope and here's all the maintenance engineers. It's got a 10 year lifespan. Here's the supply chain, et cetera. It's where you've got detail. So, a cost engineer is not an accountant. In fact, they work with everyone and they have to understand everything. So, in essence, the cost engineer works with accounting data, both financial statements and management type information. They have to be a statistician to build data sets. They have to put together data which has cost in it or effort or variations of, and all the cost drivers, the kind of engineering quantities which are driving the cost, which uh, uh, could be product-related process, could be anything. You have to understand uncertainty and when and why things go wrong, the contingencies, so they have to be risk analysts. You have to be an engineer principally, so they have to understand the grassroots of everything which is going on. Why reinforce an excavation, for example? Or, um, what's the aerodynamics mean for this? You have to understand what a full life cycle is to manage it in terms of maintenance, et cetera. But now, uh, now we have sustainability. And that's now the uh, extra piece which has to be considered somehow. And if you're, you're kind of interested uh, from an, in, an industry perspective, let me uh, direct you towards the Association of Cost Engineers and uh, the Estimating Community of Practice I am chair of. So if you look at those slides, Later on, you're more than welcome uh, uh, to be part of that. So what does a cost estimate look like? Well, this is from a, a, an estimating software I teach with. And uh, on the left, you've got breakdown, a product breakdown structure, for instance. This is product cost. Um, so all the costs are there, cost elements. You've got cost drivers here on the right. So mainly, say, complexity at early levels drives cost and weight and geometries and materials. And you've got some sort of visualization of results for communication. And there's a report there, top right. So that's what a cost estimate looks like. Or well, this is the cost of a physical crash test. Different scale, uh, different process, still a cost estimate. So here I've done some process mapping, some uh, product analysis and broken down the process of uh, crash testing a vehicle into its into its uh, detail, worked out what the costs are and what's driving those costs. So they've got um, instrumentation costs, and then there's a there's a detailed costing um, 
uh, web web based browser there. So then, okay, that's an estimate. So what's the basis of estimates? So these are all the things contributing to an estimate, and it's the methods, it's the quality of data, it's the inputs, it's the uncertainty. So you have to record a basis of estimate, and uh, this will be audited by um, people like KPMG and other people, maybe. Um, from an objective point of view for a company. But um, an important part is in included and excluded costs. So what is included and what is excluded? Now, with sustainability, those costs are outside of the organisation, maybe. Depends on how you define those costs. So emissions might be impacting society in all sorts of ways. Um, the recycling, the um, uh, different energy developments, um, uh, the impact of, of pollution, biodiversity, all these things are outside the organisation. So the problem to the cost engineer is, oh dear, now I have to include costs which are outside of the organisation, uh, related to external public domain data sets, and uh, there's all sorts of complications to this, and, and uh, lots of those complications are from a systems point of view. So... Let's say you're doing carbon offset and you think, OK, I've done a project, an engineering project. I'm going to plant a field of trees to reduce the carbon I've created, either embodied carbon or emitted or, or whatever. Uh, and in doing that, you stop someone from doing something else and they have to then create more carbon um, by not being allowed to do their engineering project. You bought, you bought the land, um, for example. So it's a complicated space to work in and there's high uncertainty and all the costs are external and we're not even talked about social costs yet. Well, here's an example of some social costs. So you've got, um, this is the utilities and this is the, the costs related to loss of supply or supply interruption. So there's an opinion about that. Is it a price? Is it a cost? Um, is it a legal quantity? Uh, is that a fair representation of the cost? Different organisations have different quantities, different basis of their estimate. Um, here's a morbid example, the cost of death um, in terms of accidents. So there's all sorts of views on that. Um, if there's a crash on the M1, um, what's the cost of that? And so sometimes you're not trying to estimate the effort involved in cleanup activities or all these things, but also cost of lost time. Or what is the customer willing to pay for something? So what is the customer willing to pay is an important new concept for cost engineers and also dose response. So if you pollute a river, what's the response in terms of chemical engineering or, or, or other processes? So you can see how complex, how complex this problem um, uh, actually is. So a cost engineer has a, has a difficult life in principle, but after practice, we'll get used to certain working practices. So good practice is to have an estimating process. So it's like, no, it's like a science where you want a repeatable process, which is auditable. Um, in an all practical sense of the term, you try your best. And here's, here's one from the Infrastructure Projects Authority, which is quite high level. And you can see stage two is about gathering data. So with our new sustainability costs, costing methodology we've developed here, uh, the university in our group. Um, we're now including sustainability-related data sources, public domain. Um, we're trying to find out as many of these as possible, and that's an important new practice for cost engineers. And new estimating methods like AI, which deal with complexity, the vast increase in inputs, the vast increase in uncertainty, the vast increase in, in the, the overall architecture of some of these uh, cost models. Um, there you've got number five, which is produced cost estimate reports. It's kind of the basis of estimate um, in the main. So uh, an important part of, of cost, um, a cost estimate is always wrong. And what's the point of, if you're making an estimate, giving one number, a single number? That uh, doesn't make sense. So we deal with ranges and probabilities and subjective probabilities. So therefore, you know, we include uncertainty and across the full life cycle of a project. So early stages, uh, clearly at concept stage, everything's very uncertain. And as life progresses, then the, this tornado, this funnel uh, reduces to a more precise answer. But we're trying to guess early on at things like that. So what did we do? So 
um, we started to identify. So, um, uh, Shiru Tao, Clara Chung, Obux, Ijuomu, and myself, we worked on a project together. And uh, uh, we, we kind of identified new types of cost drivers for a cost engineer. So those related to energy or waste reduction or the supply chain. Supply chain, usually it's a supply chain which is delivering something, not a company. So the, the actual um, configuration of that supply chain, where it is, do you want your supply chain in Australia and ship everything over to the UK? It's a tremendous carbon footprint if you did. Um, water conservation, uh, the implications of that, but also these social implications now. Um, and how do you put a cost on that? You know, this willingness to pay is is one of these concepts which would be useful for estimating such things. We're not even mentioned life cycle assessment yet. You know, what sort of materials and and nitrous oxides or what are being emitted and why. Um, and a lot of these drivers is regulation, but also the conscience of society, the customer, um, uh, and different things. So we've identified a range of cost driver categories, for instance, and here's some here's some specific some specific examples of cost drivers. I find uh, one of the most difficult ones. Uh, I mean, the one in the middle there is the World Wildlife Fund, the biodiversity. The the cost of biodiversity is. Uh, is an interesting variation. And you don't know your impact on biodiversity till later on. So it's one of these latent effects. And, he, and indeed talking about these things worries the cost of something. Well, say specifically if somebody wanted to be net zero, uh, you know, uh, wanted to be net zero, then there'd have to be some sort of investment plan to get to net zero. And that would be a specific, that could be specifically costed somehow. So at that point you would have zero carbon and the external costs will be treated as such, but there would still be external costs related to social costs and other things. So the actual identification of different types of cost and defining those costs is a really important thing to do. Now, over to the cost modeling method. So usually if, if, it's, if it's an advanced company um, and the, the cost assurance manager is okay with this, uh, because the thing, the thing with costs are everyone has to understand and buy into them. So um, use of advanced methods is a real is a real talking point because um, uh, the book stops here. In other words, the, the the senior decision makers are not statisticians. So if you produce a statistical cost model, they're not as happy as something which is an engineering build up, a detailed explanation of why costs are what they are, that's more understandable, auditable by everyone, every stakeholder group, including external customers. If you are using statistical models, then you would typically use regression. But we've been using AI and machine learning for a number of, uh, a number of reasons. So this is, this is the neural network which represents multiple linear regression for four, four inputs. Uh, going through the origin, there's no bias term there. Um, and usually do, yeah, so, so, so cost engineers do use regression analysis and they call it parametric. So they correlate cost with cost drivers. Now with sustainability, we've seen the cost drivers are different. Well, this is a machine learning uh, method. Now. So this is a neural network. And the thing to, to notice is it's a, it's a network, it's a graph. So it's not an equation. The thing to notice as well is it's very difficult to understand. Um, the other thing to notice is there's lots of equations, lots of functions on the neurons, on the nodes, and there's weights between each of these connections. It's all those levers which allow this method to be more expressive. So you can capture nuanced relationships in a neural network um, with lots of inputs, which is important if your sustainability costs are complex and uncertain and are varying a lot. So that's why it's potentially of, of great interest. And there's a specific way of using these neural networks, which, which of course you could look up, look up later on. You can see here, this is just a, a, a little piece of a network where you can see the weight connections and those, those W parameters, you're trying to tune them in to minimize the error 
between the output and the input. So you're learning the relationship between sustainability cost drivers and sustainability cost in effect. So that's our new our new method and its and its uh, advantages. However, it's very difficult to understand. It's a so-called black box method, which means you can't see under the bonnet very easily. Um, however, there are there is things like explainability and interpretability to look at things like that. Um, and working with the data, so it's a data-driven method. Um, cost estimating is principally a lot of the time a data-driven and synthesis of expert-driven method because it's the people in the loop. It's the people who are making decisions. It's a human, it's a human activity. It's not a machine activity, cost estimating. And it's human because it's all the stakeholders who are impacted. It's all the stakeholders who are making a decision. So that's that's really important. So over to, to our team. Um, who delivered? Who delivered this? Uh, Giroud did all a lot of the work for us, and uh, thank you to Giroud Tao. Excellent job uh, on this project. And uh, we we kind of used a public domain data set related to buildings and emissions. So so we kind of um, were able to test these machine learning methods on a data set which included. Um, data from the UK government about different buildings in different locations with, with you can see there, different, um, different types of, say, old building or new building with different floor areas, uh, for instance, uh, those using different uh, heating fuels um, and those where, where there were actual practical emissions and then there was the expected emissions or emissions after potential improvements. So there's a view on emissions as well from different, different perspectives. So we've got you know, really significant data set here. And we because the cost of sustainability is so difficult and uncertain, we used emissions as a proxy for sustainability cost, which opens the discussion of, do you monetize the, the factor of emissions? And... Uh, You'll, you'll probably, there's, there's, there's an interesting concept called real price uh, or true price where people talk about, okay, this is the price of something. This is the true price because of sustainability. And we come back to included and excluded costs. But in, in, this, in this research, we, we use the emissions and the, the potential uh, versus the existing as some sort of measure of sustainability. Um, and we didn't monetize it. That was our next step. That's our next, our next uh, step on this project. But we were able to use machine learning methods. Um, this is a convolutional neural network architecture, and it's more complicated than the one before. It's used in pattern recognition, and it's quite interesting because at the front end, you're kind of passing a, a square grid over the data set and converting groups of numbers into one number, the vector product. And that's really interesting in terms of what that means for the model in terms of cost. It's really advanced, it's really novel, it's really new. So we're trying to understand where the benefits are, what the benefits are, and, and these different things. But um, it's able to produce nuanced relationships. It, it, can, it can produce these complex curves where the, there might be some reason for there being a nuanced relationship. We want to look into that maybe with more conventional techniques later. So, so we kind of, therefore, our estimating process we saw previously, we've kind of uh, adapted it. So we've now got extra steps, including sustainability-related data. So things are starting to adapt and change. And, and therefore, yes, so the role of the cost engineer is being impacted. Um, and how organizations organize for that will be interesting. We can see how the, the machine learning has captured this complexity very well in terms of in terms of these noisy uh, data sets, lots of uncertainties, lots of variations. And so we got some we got some um, uh, promising results and we you know we, we're working further in this area. So what so we, so in conclusion, we um, the sustainability 
highlights that the basis of estimate is changing. So there's, uh, there's a lot of work on what's included and excluded. Um, if I may say, as a country, you might say you're, you're sustainable, but you might have outsourced everything to an unregulated country somewhere else. So there are a lot, a lot of political implications for this, lots of international boundaries. It's a systems problem. Sustainability cost drivers, are something new, highly uncertain, high variation, and there are new data sets. And perhaps machine learning and AI, if you knock them together into a, into a novel architecture, can input this complexity, but does it make sense? What sort of output do you get? So it's, you know, it's a real interesting area to, to try and make standardized or control in some way. So you get a controlled output, you know, try and uh, control the uncertainty out of the problem somehow. Uh, so that's it, that's, that's the, uh, that's everything. And I went to, I went to Minitoba in a mischievous sort of way, I guess. I don't know what. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That's not a problem. It's um, actually, yeah, one minute. Um, perfect. Um, yeah, really interesting. Thanks. Um, as somebody with a kind of interest in nature conservation, um, I wonder how this could be applied to sort of natural capital approaches and taking valuing sort of the. Uh, um, Things like flood prevention and in, in nature and that sort of thing. So maybe that'd be an interesting area to explore. Um, to one to questions. Um, um, how can AI help with cost and sustainability? Sorry, say again, sorry. Um, how can AI help with cost and sustainability? How can it help? Yes. Um, so it's, it's the, it, it, if you look at the AI as a new way of learning from lots of data, I think what's happening nowadays is there's, with all the hardware in society, um, previously you didn't have lots of sensors, for example, or lots of data being captured. Uh, every time you do something, every time you send a text, it's captured as data and these things. So there's, there's so much more information about what we do, where we do it, and what it or what with. Um, and you can start to really get some sort of more understanding of, of what is driving um, the sustainability impact. And these huge data sets require something to process with. And there's, there's no getting away from it. If you're trying to model something with lots of data, it's just going to be difficult. And does it make sense? You know, all the usual problems you get with that sort of that sort of endeavor activity. But AI just gives um, an opportunity to learn from data um, using such things as deep learning, for example. So very expressive models, but they're black box models. But you can aggregate lots of inputs and uncertain inputs. And I think it's a way you process. If you get some data, you've got to process it somehow. So you've got to clean that data, make it into a shape so that the making a prediction out of it makes sense in the first place. So the principle of, okay, we've got lots of data, let's use AI, but hang on a minute, let's process that to put into the AI so it's more deterministic in nature so that, so that the assumption that the AI will make a reasonable prediction is true. So you've got, you got to... You got to do some engineering. You got to do some data science and data engineering to use these methods in the first place. And um, perhaps, perhaps they're a way of assuring existing methods, or they could be a way of identifying opportunities to do more analysis. Or just like with pattern recognition, you know, if if you put a if you put a picture in something and it says yes, it's a, it's a computer. Well, you could put some information in something and say, yes, it's sustainable, or no, it isn't. So it's like some sort of categorization. And with, and with chat GPT, you might, you might just need some advice. You might just say, okay, uh, what data should I be thinking, what, thinking of in terms of sustainability costs? And say, well, have you thought about this? So there are improvements or assurance or advice where AI can, can form some sort of contribution to an overall an overall view of uh, of these things, but um, certainly, yeah, so certainly that's the way of see thing. There might be many different ways of seeing it as well. Uh, I think it'd be quite interesting to see it working with a kind of 
digital twin model where we use loads of low cost sensors to simulate say a building or, and, or nature and we can use maybe we can unleash the power of ai to to calculate that data and, and make sense of it um it's definitely quite an exciting prospect that, that's an interesting point now because I, I know people i've seen i've seen applications where people are considering sustainability metrics or performance indicators but what you're doing is building a database of this is what's happened and then of course if you've got that you can build a general model out of it to try and extrapolate or interpolate will this will this be acceptable for other things um early on so you can make early predictions before you've got any detail so you can produce databases of useful um prediction inputs or you know to build models with that's really interesting. Um, should sustainability be monetized? Yeah, I mean, that is, um, I think, uh, does it make sense to put a monetary value on something so uncertain? Uh, I think, I think I've, in, in other estimating uh, practices, like in the space industry or, or NASA and these places, we tend to just uh, develop three scenarios. You know, like the worst case, best case, and most likely, and um, put a value to that. So, so there is a way of dealing with these highly complex situations, these, these VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous projects. Um, is is to is to try and detail scenarios and put a probability on those scenarios, but have a but have an accurate cost for that scenario. And then the uncertainty is: will that scenario actually occur or not? So the uncertainty has moved around a bit, and the costs are accurate. So that's the uh, that's one of the the way people solve that problem. Um, yep. Um, and probably the final question: um, What are the challenges of cost and sustainability? Uh, it's a quick one to end. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. You're, you're, on my on my laptop, you're breaking up. But it's uh, some of the keys aren't working either, so it might be that. <laughs> is it, is it to repeat it. So, uh, yeah. What What are the challenges of cost and sustainability? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, challenges of cost. Well, you could you could argue you could argue things should be sustainable. Although people say, don't they? We want to be sustainable. We can't afford it. It's going to cost too much. Um, and starting to talk about sustainability cost drivers could be a could be a start on that. And indeed, indeed, there is people talk about the true price. So if you if if you if you think about the true price of plastic bottles on average, if you think about okay, there's the cost of the barrier reef in Australia, or there's the cost of recycling, or there's the cost of the average impact of granules of plastic. And so on. if you actually put an actual real price on something, then perhaps it isn't an expensive thing to be more sustainable. So it's a discussion to be had, but it's so difficult to define precisely the cost of sustainability. And that is that is the challenge, you know. Who is responsible? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a big challenge for all sustainability, I think. Um, we're coming up to three o'clock, so um, thank you very much, Paul and Jen, oh, thank you. for your talks. Really, as usual, we've got two really different ones, and that's that's. Great. Um, we have got a another one of these next month, um, 28th of March. Um, with a link in the chat there for the Eventbrite, and you can find it on our website as well, and probably on Twitter or X, as it's called now. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. Um, thanks for the talks, everybody. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone.